Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We'd like to say a good morning, a good evening, and a good afternoon to you all as we have people joining from all over the world. My name is Yasmina Greco. I am with O'Reilly Media, and I will be your host for today's webcast. Today, folks, we have Stephen Citron Pusti with us, and he is going to talk to you about Leaflet, Node.js, and MongoDB for an easy and fun web mapping experience. Steve is an evangelist with OpenShift. He goes around and shows off all the great work that OpenShift engineers do. He can teach you about pause with Java, PostgreSQL, MongoDB, mobile JavaScript, some Android, and a little bit of iPhone, and even some Python. He has spoken at over 50 conferences and done over 30 workshops, including Monktoberfest, Mongo New York, Java One, Ajax World, Esri, Developer Conference, GeoWeb, Where 2.0, and SAP TechEd, to name just a few. Before OpenShift, Steve was a developer evangelist for LinkedIn and Decarta. Steve has a PhD in ecology from the the University of Connecticut. He likes building interesting applications and helping developers create great solutions. Folks, Stephen is also going to be speaking at O'Reilly's Fluent Conference next month, March 11th through the 13th in San Francisco, California. And during the event, we'll let you know a little bit more about that. But to get things started, we would like you to open your group chat widget, as that is what we're going to use today to communicate and interact with each other. This is also where you're going to be able to post and submit questions for Stephen, and we'll ask that you please preface them with a capital letter Q so we know that they're for him and we can make sure we see it for Q&A. You can also open, move, and resize any of the other widgets. If you'd like to tweet from the Twitter widget today, you might need to give it permission to access your account. The Twitter widget will automatically append the event's hashtag to your tweet so you don't have to, and today, our hashtag is FluentConf, all one word. If you have any trouble with the event today, please take a look at your help widget. If you continue to have trouble, just post it in the group chat, and one of our staff will help you right away. If you experience any choppy audio or stalled visuals, please try refreshing your window. And remember, the best thing you can do for a good audio stream is close any apps that could interfere. People always ask, so we'd like you to know we are recording today's webcast, and we will have the recorded version available usually within 48 hours. And folks, at this time, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Stephen for his presentation. Hello, Stephen. Hi there, and thanks, everybody, for joining. Let me launch the screen share. Okay, there we go, and you should be seeing my screen now. Let's go to our presentation. Okay, so you already heard the title from Yasmin. Thanks, Yasmin. Um, if you, uh, the slide that was showing at the beginning gave the URL actually for this talk. This is all up in Reveal.js on an open shift here, so you can follow along as you want if you don't want to keep looking at my screen share. Um, that's my name. And there's, I'm the Steve Zero because I'm beat like that. <laughs> on uh, Twitter, Ingress, SmugMug, IRC, and GitHub. Probably some other places too, but those are all the places you can find me if you want to ask me questions or send feedback. Uh, let's get started with the talk because we only have an hour. And so because we only have an hour, I'm only going to give you a little bit about MongoDB Spatial, not even too much about Mongo. I'll give a little introduction because I'm not going to assume everybody understands it, but um, I'm going to try to focus mostly on the spatial stuff. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about Node.js. There's tons of free resources out on the web to learn about it, um, but I'm going to try to give some of the relevant points and why you might want to use it. I'll also be showing back code, which is the part I think you'll find most interesting. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about Leaplist.js. That's the JavaScript library that does mapping. I would say it's that and open layers are probably the two predominant JavaScript libraries out on the web today that, is, you know, uh, that works with multiple mapping providers. And then I'm going to teach you a little bit about platform as a service so you can spin this all up quickly yourself in a matter of minutes. And then the, at the end, you'll be able to spin this, the exact same up app yourself, and you can even change the data and make your own application. And I'll show an example of that. And it's, I think you'll find it fun. That's the goal. So the assumptions are you have worked with data. I hope that's not too big of an assumption. Um, you can write some JavaScript code. This is a full stack JavaScript application, so you'll have to understand at least some JavaScript to do it. Uh, even if you don't understand it today, 
at least you can read it and maybe follow along, and then you can understand it later. Um, just so that you know, the web service that I'm writing in Node.js today, I, I also have examples of writing it in Python and Java. And one of my coworkers has written it in Ruby, uh, and another one has written it in PHP. So the Mongo part stays constant between all those, and the leaflet part stays constant. So if you feel comfortable with a different layer, I can send out URLs for those other applications later, um, those other versions of the languages later. But today we're going to do all Node.js and JavaScript on the front end. And then I'm assuming you're going to ask questions. And Yasmin, I, well, since I'm in screen share mode, I won't be able to actually see the questions. So I'll ask you to interrupt me every once in a while. When I usually give talks in person, I, I prefer people interrupt. But also because we only have about an hour, I'm going to try to strike a balance and then leave questions at the end maybe also a bit so that um, people get through the entire talk. And we are covering quite a bit. All right. So what's the scenario that's like driving this situation? Uh, we work for a vendor that sells souvenirs at national parks in the United States and Canada. We're making a check-in service to try, help drive traffic to our stand. Right? The product manager comes and says, we're not getting enough traffic at our physical stands. I want you to write a check-in app so that we can show all our stands and then offer them a 20% coupon when they check in. Write it. Write it right now. And they say, we want it on FOSS, free and open source software, because we don't want to be locked in and we don't want to pay anything necessarily for the software. We want to be able to spin it ourselves if we can't. So make sure it's all free and open source technology. And then they say, it's due next week because we've already got the promo getting ready to go. And you're like, oh my gosh. Well, I'm here to say that it's not actually, you can actually build something workable within a week to get that all going. And that's what we're going to be doing today. And I think this scenario, the more important part about this scenario, suppose you work for a government agency and there's an emergency and you need to show all the bridges that are out. Right? Or you work for some um, nonprofit organization and you want to actually quickly do a map and display of, um, I don't know, historic, land, uh, historic manhole covers. You're really into that. You can easily do the exact same thing that I'm doing here today. Basically, this app can take any set of points and put them onto a map to display really quickly. You can have it up and running in, uh, with this Git repo, and you, as soon as you put your data in, you can have it up and running in 10 to 15 minutes and on a public URL so people can use it. It's really great for situational apps as well. Okay, but, so by the end of this talk, you can build this map. This is what we are going to end up building. Right? If you click the link, you'll be coming to the same thing you're seeing here on the screen. So it's a national park locator. They put the points on the maps wherever there's a national park service, either in the U.S. or Canada, owned property. So it's not necessarily a park. It's anything managed by the park service. So like here's Boston National Historic Park. Here's the African American National Historic Site. See, so it's not a park. But you can also zoom out and pull in more parks and properties as you zoom out. It will also pick up new things as you zoom over. You'll see there's a lot in New York. It will pick up a lot when we get to D.C. And you can see this is actually quite fast, and I'm sure some of you are hitting this at the same time. Um, and this is actually, we can pull in all, Leaflet does a really nice job of handling a lot of points. So that's actually over 500 points in the browser at once, which is pretty amazing for those of you who know a lot with, who remember the old mapping days of putting a lot of points in the browser. And they're all responsive with their own name on them. Okay? So that's what we're going to be building by the end of today's application. So let's go on to the talk. So on to Mongo. So a bit about MongoDB for those who don't know much about it. Uh, MongoDB is a document store. Right? There's a lot of NoSQL types of databases. Mongo is the type which is called a document store. And a document is just a bunch of attributes. And you can have attributes and values and where the value is actually other attributes and values. Right? It's just a big JSON document. It can be nested. Right? So this helps avoid joins. One of the reasons this was done Mongo is built in the first place is to help avoid expensive joins. So if you're doing a check-in service, you might actually store all the check-ins along with the location in the same document. So for when each user checks in, you might store them all in the same document. That way when you go to request who's checked in at this place or you get the place, you get all the check-ins at the same time. Right? So the database doesn't have to go do a join and then ship that all back to you. It just basically gives it all to you at once, which is, can be very quick for certain types of applications. Um, the problem with that, though, everything comes with its trade-offs. The problem with that, though, is it does not maintain, if you update that user's name, it does not update that in, the, let's say, in the check-in table. So that's the trade-off that you get there. It's schemaless. And by schemaless, there is a schema, but the schema can be changed on the fly by the developer. So if the product manager comes to you or someone else comes to you and says, oh, you forgot to add you know, the, the foundry that stamped this manhole cover into the data document. I need that in there right away. You don't actually have to do a schema change. Your application code just starts putting that attribute into the JSON documents that it delivers, and Mongo will accept it and put it in there. 
Right? So that's great for rapid iteration development or a, where you have a product manager who's changing their mind a lot. Um, the drawback to this though is if you put a, two people are working on the code or you're working on the code and you put a typo in one of the fields, it won't stop you. Right? It will just push the data into a new field, no problem. So you have to be very coordinated in team efforts and you also have to pay attention to your typos. Um, it's really good at fast write, but you give up immediate consistency. So what this means is, um, and I'm not going to go too in-depth to this, but what this means is like if I check in, if I have a, sh a sharded uh, MongoDB database where there's a lot of MongoDB databases in a cluster, uh, I, it'll say, yes, I've got your check-in to the application code, but someone else looking to use check-in may have to wait. Right? It, it, so it gets really good at fast writes because you can actually even tune Mongo to say as soon as it hits the network, not even until it goes into memory, but as soon as it hits the network, return to the application code that I've actually got it. Right? So that's very fast, but the problem is that means it may be a bit a while before someone else actually gets to see that write. Right? So I don't want my bank using Mongo for financial transactions, but I, for a social check-in service where all I care about is a check-in and I don't want to wait for it to say, yeah, you're checked in, and if I lose it, it's not a big deal, and if it, someone has to wait a minute to see it or two minutes to see it, I don't care, and I think it's actually perfect for that scenario. And it's easy to horizontally scale. I'm not going to go into this too much either, but what that means is they've built the software so it's very easy to make it a uh, shard or cluster. they built in a whole bunch of functions to do that. So that's it for Mongo for now. Um, I'm going to go on to some spatial. And after I finish the Mongo and the spatial section, I'll take a break to see if we have any questions. So MongoDB uh, has very limited spatial capability. Uh, for those of you who have used PostGIS or SQL Server or Spatial or Oracle Spatial, those are full-blown, real, you can do basically all of your GIS operations in the database. Mongo instead takes more of the, we're going to do 20% of the functions that satisfy 80% of the users. Right? So the only functionality it has is near, so what things are near this other thing. Containment, what things are actually within this other thing, like is this point within this polygon. And then intersection, do these two lines cross, do these two polygons cross. Those are the only three functions you can do currently in MongoDB. But it turns out for most consumer applications, that's all you will ever need, uh, especially for all check-in applications, right? And so, yeah, you have a lot more power with those other databases, but there's also more complexity in getting them spun up and actually getting them going. So this actually, is, it depends on what you actually need. This can be the right tool for the job. Right? And if you want to dig into more details on how that all works, I've given you the links to the main geospatial pages there. Right? And then there's two types of indices that Mongo has and that gives it its spatial functionality. One is called a 2D index, and that's for flat surfaces. For those GIS heads out there, this is what you would use if you were doing projected data as well. Right? So if you were using California State Plain or UTM data, you would use a 2D index um, because that's X and Y, right? just straight X and Y without any degrees uh, and it's not on a sphere. And then there's also a 2D sphere index, and this helps with coordinates on an Earth-like sphere, right? Because there's certain properties about being on a sphere or coordinates that are measured on a sphere, like distance measurements, because latitude and longitude don't stay constant as you move up and down the globe. Um, so these actually help with some of those distance measurements. 2D sphere is what you would use if you were taking GPS measurements off of a um, TD Sphere is what you use with GPS measurements, right? So if you're checking in from a phone, that's a GPS. And by default, TD Sphere uses WGS84, which is what your GPS uses by default on the phone, right? Or most of the people going out doing handheld data collection. Things that are good to know about Mongo Spatial, um, with 2.4, which is currently running on OpenShift and in lots of other places, it handles GeoJSON data types natively. So the benefit of putting stuff in GeoJSON is that um, Mongo knows how to translate that back and forth between degrees and meters. So all your distance units can actually be in meters rather than degrees, latitude, and longitude, or radians, which is very hard for people to understand in natively without a calculator and a bunch of geometry books. So that's one really big benefit. And the other is that it always assumes that GeoJSON is on a sphere right now. Uh, it assumes the coordinates are between minus 180 and 180, and that's because it's assuming that you're on the globe, right? You'll never get values bigger than that on a globe. Um, if you want to change that though, like if let's say you're doing a UTM or California State Plain or you're doing measurements in your backyard, like you did a grid in your backyard and you're using meters, um, you can 
tell the index that this is the new range that you should consider. Right? So it's configurable, but by default, it assumes minus 180 and 180. Um, they give you the formula to convert between in back and forth between human readable units and radians. So you can do that and put that actually directly into your query, or you can put that in your application code. It doesn't matter either place. And so how do you actually get to make it work? So for those of you who use Oracle Spatial or PostGIS, this part will be you'll leave with a big smile on your face for this part because it's incredibly simple. And for those of you who haven't, you'll still have a big smile on your face because it's incredibly simple. Um, first, you put your coordinates either into an array. So there's an example here. The, the, this is an, actually a JSON document, right? This is a document right here. It's a Mongo document as well. There is a field called location, and we've made an array of the coordinates, and there's the array of the coordinates, right? So that's all you have to do. You put your data in like that. If you're working with latitude and longitude, make sure to put it in longitude, latitude order. Right? That makes all the calculations come out right. If you work with GeoJ, or you can put your data in in GeoJSON format. So here again, we have the location field. And then this is a GeoJSON uh, coordinate document. So we're saying the type is a point, and the coordinates are this and this. Right? You could do the same thing with a polygon or a line. And it's all laid out on those documentation pages I gave you. You don't have to. Uh, but this is basically the format. So you just make sure when you're importing your documents or you're inserting your documents, you have a field that has an array or a GeoJSON field that has the coordinates in it. And then you either make a 2D sphere index, so DD places, that's the collection, which is, for those of us in the SQL world, or um, you can think of as the table. And you say, on this table, ensure an index on the field called location and call it a 2D sphere. And with 2D sphere, you can do a compound index. So you could use something like index on name and location, right? Or, um, manhole type, or telephone pole type, or you know, status of the bridge, just if you wanted to make quicker queries that way. Or you can just make a straight 2D index, and that's what I do today. Um, so DB places is your index, location 2D, and that's it. You're done. You have now spatially enabled that collection, and you can do spatial queries on it. And I'll show you some of those spatial queries um, in code, in the, in the JavaScript code, which looks very similar to the console in Mongo in a little bit. All right, so before we go on to Node.js, uh, are there any questions? Stephen, I'm not seeing any questions that have come in yet, so we're just going to let folks know who may have joined after we made the announcement. Folks, anytime you have a question, open your group chat widget, type it in, send it in, and we'll be checking periodically for those. Back to you, Stephen. Oh, yeah, and one other thing, for the international people in the audience, I know, I, you know I'm from New York. Yo, I'm from New York, and I tend to talk very fast. So um, if I'm talking too fast, you can just say your question is, can you talk slower? So uh, that would be good feedback for me to hear. Anybody? Nothing coming through yet, so we'll turn it back no, to you. No question? Great. I'm such a great speaker that I'm clear and nobody has any questions. That is, wow, you guys are great. I love you guys. All right. And I use guys also in the Northeast sense of the word, which includes men and women. That is not a gender-specific term in the Northeast. All right. Um, on to Node.js. So Node.js, what – this part's actually going to be quite short because uh, it's a, actually a huge topic, and I just want to give a brief introduction. So why is there all this fuss about Node.js? You hear stuff all over the place about Node.js being the new hotness, and it's this great thing. One of the reasons is it's all in JavaScript. Right? So you write your server-side code in JavaScript, and then you actually write your client-side code in JavaScript, so you only need to really basically know one language to write your entire application, both server-side and client-side. Right? Um, the actual engine itself uses, I think it uses V8, which is the JavaScript engine from Chrome, uh, the Chrome project, which is written in C, but everything that you do to program using it is JavaScript. So if you know JavaScript, you can write server-side languages already, which is very appealing to a lot of groups, because then you can have people working on both sides. Another thing is you get, a, you get great asynchronous behavior out of the box. Um, so AJAX, which stands for, I forget what, but the first A in AJAX stands for asynchronous, right? And so that whole idea of your web page making an asynchronous call back to a server, you can now push that down to your server level where your server can make an asynchronous call to a database or to some other processing and go on to other stuff and wait for that call to come back. Right? And so you're not tying up your server waiting for calls to come back from the database 
or from some processing code or anything else. It basically just responds as it gets responses back from whatever it called to, which can lead to fat, making it very fast and lightweight for certain use cases. The most particular one is when you're not DB bound, right? Or if you have a really big DB with lots of connections and you can just keep processing them all and it keeps going, right? But the idea is you get really fast throughput because you keep doing all these really quick calls and returning them right away and not tying up the whole server. So that's where people have been talking about it a lot. Um, my unofficial, this is very unofficial since I'm no node expert, nor do I really like to get into religious wars, especially over things like editors or programming languages, I think they all, or databases. I think they all have their own purposes, but here's where I think you should use it. You're a team of JS programmers, right? So the idea is you're all JS programmers on your team, or most everybody's a JavaScript programmer, then this makes a lot of sense because there's no skill training that's needed in terms of learning a new programming language. Every, you can move back and forth. I think it makes a lot of sense in that, in that way. You want to serve up a lot of things really fast, serving up a lot of um, static tiles, serving up images, things you're serving up really quickly, really quick responses from the server, and you want to serve up a lot of them, right? You're not I.O. bound. You want to actually get more to I.O. bound, that would be a good way to be doing it. Um, and one of the, the drawbacks right now, since Node is so relatively new in the server world, is you don't need all the libraries that some of the other languages bring. So for example, Python and Java have very large third-party libraries outside of the core language. They're not really, I don't know if you call it third-party or not, but whatever. They have a lot of libraries that do a lot of different functions, and most of those have not been ported to JavaScript, right? So like, for example, um, Python has face detection, and I think Java has a face detection algorithm. And so you can just plug that library in, or you can do things like uh, POI, which is a Java library for tearing apart Excel spreadsheets. You can basically use that right out of the box. There isn't that same kind of functionality from Node.js. So if you don't need that right now, then I, that's another reason why you could think about using Node. Okay? One of the things I do want to caution you about, don't drink too much of the Kool-Aid. This area is actually very heavily in a, um, in a religious war right now, especially between the JavaScript group saying they're the fastest ever, and the, it's just it's a hot bucket of water. This video is actually quite funny. I'm sure some of you have already started watching it. Um, you can click on the link if you want, but maybe you should wait until after we're done. It's about a six-minute video, but it's actually quite funny. Um, just be aware that it doesn't solve all problems, and it's not the second coming. Okay? It's great for some use cases, and it's not great for others. Any questions on that? Actually, we do have one question that has come in from Earl. Earl would like to know, he says, I thought backend of Node.js on the server was C code. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, right. So the actual, the Node server itself is using Chrome, and Chrome is written in C. Right? So all the JavaScript is being interpreted and run through C, a C program. But the code that you write when you're writing Node.js is JavaScript code. So it's kind of like saying, well, when you run JavaScript on the client, it's running in C. Yeah, it's running in SpiderMonkey, or it's running in um, Chrome. Um, did I say Chrome? I didn't mean Chrome. I meant V8 from Chrome. Um, it's running in a C library running on the client that interprets and runs your JavaScript. Does that clear it up, Earl? I'm not seeing any additional questions, Stephen. So back to you. Okay. So now we've, we've done the database layer, we've done the app server layer, and so now we're going to go to the client side to do mapping, right? Because we've got a spatial data store, we've got an app server to serve up some of that spatial data, and now we have to figure out how we're going to display the map. Right? And so I'm going to show you today is Leaflet. I think this is actually probably, in my, Steve's unofficial opinion, this is the best JavaScript library out there right now for 90% of the use cases. Um, and let's get a little bit into it. So the quick intro, it's a lightweight, it's actually quite lightweight, JavaScript client-side library for doing great maps, really nice maps. Um, it works out of the box with OpenStreetMap, map, sorry, OpenStreetMap, which is one of my favorite projects. OpenStreetMap aims to be the Wikipedia of map data. And um, it's all you know, Creative Commons licensed, and you can get, or ODBL now, I think. Anyway, it's got a really good license on it, so anybody can use it. And in some areas of, of the world, it's the best map data there is out there. Um, and it works right out of the box, but it, there's also plugins and other libraries that it can work with, so make it work with Google Maps and Yandex and, whole, and Nokia, Nokia Wear Maps. There's a whole bunch of different libraries that allows it to work with other mapping platforms as well. 
Uh, but I think you should use OpenStreetMap because it's the best, and the more people that use it, the better it gets. That was my, now I'll get off my soapbox. Um, it's mobile ready. So when you use it, you can actually just, you can, it works right on a mobile client or it works on a desktop client, no problem. It works both, on both, or a tablet. And it has a rich library of plugins. I'm not going to go to that page today, but I gave you the link there. There are a ton of plugins for Leaflet that allow you to do basically almost anything you want in the map, like change the opacity of layers, um, have the point move around and track it, draw on the map, and then send that back as JSON to the, the server side. It does a lot of different things, and it's extensible. So if you wanted to add some sort of other plugin for your own company, you could totally do that, and you don't even have to open source that part, right? That's the nice part about plugins. You can open source it, and I like open source, but you don't have to. Um, all the projects I'm talking to you about today are open source projects as well. So that's basically the idea behind it. And I think we've gotten to the part where it's enough talk, code. So that link there actually goes to this GitHub repo. So it's the Stevo, and then it's Fluent Web Map is the repo that I made. And I'm going to show you, this is the whole project that brings up that map. So first, let's actually look at the park coordinates. So this is the park coordinates, and you can see they're all just JSON documents. Name field, and then the, it has a name value, a string, and it has a pause field, and then that has an array of coordinates. That's all you have to do. So if you wanted to adapt this to your own data, you could actually change name to whatever you wanted to change it to, change the coordinates to whatever you wanted to, add other fields if you wanted, but it just basically has to look like this, which is actually quite simple data to create. Okay. So then, I'm not going to show you the MongoDB database today. I'm just going to show you the um, I'm going to show you the code that goes in and reaches reaches in and gets it. So we're going to use server.js. This is where I get to show you a bit of callbacks, right? So we're using the Express framework, which for those of you who are Ruby heads, it's kind of like Sinatra, and for those of you who are Python heads, it's kind of like Flask, right? So it's not the heavyweight of um, Rails or Django. It's more of a less opinionated framework for doing web applications. And it's really actually quite good for making REST services. It's really quite simple, right? So what you can see up here in the top is we do some setup where we get all the stuff ready for the database. This is these lines right here. Right? And then I'm going to actually go to the bottom because that's actually where the app starts up. So we make a new app. And then on the app we call ConnectDB. And inside the callback, we say start the server, right? So here is the start server, where it actually starts up the node server. And then here is where it connects to the DB. So this is where it actually connects up to the database. After it's done connecting to the database, it starts the server. It starts the node server, right? And now we have a connection to the database, and now we can start doing our queries. Um, if we were going to make this into a real production app, I would think we might do some sort of um, pooling. So that for the connections, so that we don't release them every time after we're done, because making connections is somewhat expensive to any database. All right. So what we do first is we define a bunch of routes. Let me find them. Here they are, right? So we're defining this self app, and then we define the HTTP verb right here, get or post. Right? So here, if someone calls self app get slash ws slash parks, we're going to call the function called return all parks, right? And so we can go through and map a whole bunch of URLs to different functions up above. This actually could go in a separate file, as could the other functions, or we might actually just keep the routes in a more, in a more production ready app. I would take these routes, leave them in here, and then put the functions into another file, right? So it's really clear to see what functions there are, and then it's easy to see what functions are on the other page as well. This is just kind of written as a quick and dirty, let's get it going thing, right? You can see here when I say this, this nomenclature right here means from this URL, so when someone puts in WS parts park and then they pass in uh, something after that, we're going to yank that out and make that into the ID. That's actually going to be available to the code. Right? So that's how you pull stuff from the URL. You put the colon in front of it and you give it a name. The one that we're using, the only function that we're actually using in this application is within. Right? Because basically what I'm doing, and you'll see that in the code later is, anytime someone drags, or zooms the map, I say, give me the bounding box of the map and send that back to the server and pull back all the points which are within that box. Right? So that's this within function here. So let's go look at the within function. There it is right there. 
So when someone calls it the within function, we're expecting four pieces to the query. Again, if this was production code, you would check to make sure these actually parse this floats and they're in the valid ranges and all that stuff, but this is just a quick hacking application. So I'm parsing the floats out, and then I say self db on the collection part point. So this is basically now doing a Mongo query. Do a find where the pause field is geo within a box. And that box is defined by these four, these two pairs of lat longs, long two, lat two, long one, lat one. And that's it. That's the entire function of the pullback of bounding box query. Right? And then I say, okay, on the response, say it's JSON, and then JSON stringify the result set. Right? Because that's this right here. On the callbacks and all the callbacks, it's going to return names. That's the data that comes back. I could name that something else if I wanted to, and then it would change that there. But that's all you have to do to write the query. So for example, I know if we wanted to look at the one where we find all the maps and return all the parks, right, which is just the slash ws slash parks, the function is self db collection park points. That's the table or collection park points. Find. Dot find is the same as select star from, and you get everything back, right? And then I'm saying return in the callback, we've got a thing called names. And if there's an error, there's an error. And all I'm doing is JSON stringifying names. And that, let me go ahead and just show you what that looks like. If I do slash ws slash parks, there it is. Right? It just returns all the parts that you saw in the JSON file. And it's added an ID. Right? That, 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 the database does that by default, unless you tell it not to. So that's how easy it is to write the web services. So the first thing I did was I wrote this service, the within function, right? Just so I could get all the parts within the bounding box. Any questions on that? Looks like the, I don't see any down here. Oh, now I see some. Uh, let's see. You know what? We're at 12.30, and there seems to now be – there's no – oh, there's a ton of questions here. So let me actually come back to this. Yeah, uh, let me ask, answer this one, number three, from uh, – who is this from? From Thales I, – sorry, I can't get that Greek or Cypriot name. That's just too hard for me. So um, would PostgreSQL be a fit with its JU spatial capabilities for such an app? Yep, it is. And I've rewritten this app uh, using PostGIS, using Lucene, and also using um, Hibernate Spatial, right? So, and my coworker, Ryan uh, Jarvanen, he's also written it with just straight uh, Node.js and PostGIS and does the exact same map. So yeah, you could totally do this. Um, it's just, it depends on how much you want to, how much you want to dig in, that's all. So, uh, part of the thing, uh, thing I love about this one is Mongo is really quick and easy to set up and it's really quick and easy to put data in it doesn't actually require much knowledge of, you know, you don't have to, like with SQL, you kind of have to understand the SQL queries a bit. You have to understand create table syntaxes, all that stuff. If you really want something quick and easy, um, I think this is the fastest way to go. So how do I mark that answer? Is that a check? I think so. No. Yeah, good. Okay, I'll come back. Uh, does this work with, for polygons? Yeah, it could if you stored polygons in the database, and then, then I'll show you in the leaflet code where you would have to draw it differently. But you could query for polygons or anything like that. All right? Uh, in Hotep, you do not need to know C. You, uh, all you need to know for this entire application is JavaScript. Okay? What is the geo within? Geo within is kind of it, what's within this box, right? So geo within says when I do that query, I'm, and remember I'm passing in the bounding box from the map view, it's saying return any item that's within that bounding box. So geo within says whatever's within that bounding box. You could use a polygon, like an arbitrary polygon there. You can use a box. You can also pass in a circle to the geo within. There's all sorts of fields you can pass in. And then it'll return any items within that field that you pass in as the query part. All right, I'm going to take a break from questions just for a little bit. And then um, I'm going to actually finish up the presentation and then go back to the questions. Uh, and if, you, if I didn't answer any of your questions enough, please re-ask the question in a different way. Okay, so we've written our app server now, right? And we know that it's going to respond 
let me go back down here again for a second. When we pass to the whatever the URL is slash ws slash parks slash within, we're going to get back, and if we pass another two points which make a bounding box, we're going to get back some points. Right? And so now I want to show you the leaflet code, which is actually incredibly even more simple than anything I've shown so far. And you might be saying, well, that wasn't all that simple. But this is really simple if you know any uh, JavaScript and you've ever worked with JavaScript. <laughs> so basically we pull in leaflet, the CSS. We, I've made, I like that nice font. That's the font on top. Here all this stuff is just basically some extra leaflet stuff and also making it scale nicely. Right? So the interesting part here is this is how you define a map. Right? So basically what I'm doing with this is I'm making a variable called map. It's going to be the map container on the page. I'm setting the view to be centered at this coordinates and at this zoom level. Right? And then I'm making a marker layer group because I want to be able to put the pins in that. And then for I'm making a tile layer, which is going to be all the tiles that show up the background map, right? And here, I'm, you need to have a server that you can point this to, and here I'm pointing at the, the tiles at OpenStreetMap. Um, my coworker, Ryan Jarvanen, has used the Stamen one because they have a very pretty map, um, which actually uses the OpenStreetMap data underneath. But there's lots of different providers you can plug in here. And then we're saying the maximum zoo level is 18. That's how far you can zoom in. And the attribution, this is basically saying who it belongs to. And we say, take that layer after you've made it and add it to the map. And that's it. These three lines, right? Actually, you don't even need this marker layer group. If you just wanted a map that can slide around, you just need these two lines of JavaScript. Right? And you can have a map that slides around. If you want to start adding pins, you're going to need this. Right? So what happens is, let me start down here on the map. So I'm defining some on drag end. So on the map, on drag end, so we, have, we register a listener. This is when you've stopped dragging. Or when you stop zooming, call the function get pins. Right? And then after you're done with that, when ready, also get pins. So this function here is also when the map is draws for the first time, call get pins. So no matter what we do to the map, we actually want it to get pins. Right? So get pins says map.getbounds. And that's where I get the bounding box. And then I make a URL with that bounding box right there. And then I call get on the URL, which is up here. Pin the map is the callback function, and I want to work with JSON. Right? I can change that to, I think, CSV, and I think there's some, and probably uh, XML, because there's a, uh, oh, the name is escaping me now of the XML format for geography stuff, but there's a XML format. But basically what we're doing is call this URL, using jQuery here, call this URL, and pin the map is what we call on the callback. And so pin the map says remove layer. So I'm removing all the markers that were there before. I'm making a new marker array, and it's the same length as the data that came back to pin the map, all the data that came back. And then I'm just looping through the array and making a bunch of markers. Right? I go through data. I say as long as the data is there, get data level i. That's going to be a park. I make a marker where park position 1, park position 2, and then I bind the pop-up because I want the pop-up to show up, is the name. This could be anything you want it to be, right, which you bind here. And this is just the, la the longitude and latitude. And I put that into the marker array, and then I just tell the layer, here's the layer group, here's the marker arrays that you should put in there, add to the map, and that's it. Then that's our new marker layer group. And we need to keep that because we're going to clear it if we pan again. And that's it. That's how much it takes to put pins on a map. And it seems like a lot while I'm talking through it here on the phone and you're trying to follow along. And I've talked about four other things or five other pretty deep things before. But if you sit down with this code, it's actually not that hard to figure out how to change this to make it anything you want. Um, so that's it for the entire application. You're now done. Right? That's all the code you need. But I think some of you are probably feeling like you're looking at this set of instructions. You're like, great. Now I have to learn how to install Mongo. Now I have to learn how to install Node. Now I have to get a URL set up. I have to get a server set up. I have to get all this going. I don't, forget it. So I'm going to do a little pitch for OpenShift or Platform as a Service in general. Basically what you can do is with OpenShift Online, so OpenShift is Red Hat's Platform as a Service. It's open sourced. OpenShift Origin 
is where you can stand up the platform as a service yourself. And with platform as a service, the idea is you issue one command, and you can spin up all the infrastructure that you need, and you just start writing code through Git pushes. And I'll show you the instructions just before we're done. So OpenShift Origin is the uh, open source upstream project for all everything we do here, and that's it's uh, Apache 2 license, and it's free. It's on GitHub. Anybody can check it out and run this platform as a service if they wanted to. If you don't want to run the platform as a service yourself, you can use OpenShift Online where Red Hat hosts it. You sign up for an account, and then you, you're good to go. Or if you're a company who wants to bring it inside and you want support and you want something a little bit slower moving than the upstream project, you can purchase OpenShift Enterprise, and you can run this platform as a service yourself. Right? And these are, I'm not going to go through all the pieces on this slide right here right now, but some of you, you can either come back or you can see that not only do we do Node, we do a bunch of others, and we do a bunch of different data stores right out of the box, and we have some package apps, and if you want to come back and look and say, oh, look, I could actually do Ruby with PostgreSQL or Ruby with, Mo with uh, MySQL, I'll give it a try. This is a place to look, right? And we have a lot of Java pieces as well for those of you who are Java heads. Um, the last bit about OpenShift is we have a free tier with no time limit, right? And that's free forever, and as long as you stay within the resource bounds we give you, uh, you, you can run there forever. You can make, if, someone, if you get someone to pay you $1,000 a page view, you can keep all that money yourself. Right? We give you three gears. These are actually Linux containers. If you, think, if you know about Linux containers, you can think, if you don't, you can think of them like servers. Each is 5, 12 megs of RAM and 1 gigabyte of disk space, which is pretty generous for free with no time limit. Um, it auto scales. So that app I made, the one that you're looking at, it will automatically scale up the Node.js tier if there starts to be a lot of connections coming in spin up a new server, put the code in there, plug it into the load balancer, and serve up the new connections, and then spin it down after the connections go away. Right? And there's a simple pricing model. Basically, we just charge you on the amount of memory and the amount of disk space you use, and it's up on the pricing page. So I don't want to talk about it too much more, but we don't meter on bandwidth. We don't meter on number of transactions. It's basically memory and disk space, which are things developers pretty much know about. But the best part for this is that we uh, – I'll show you what it takes. We'll go back to this Git repo again. This is what it takes. This Git repo actually is fully set to go to bring it up on OpenShift, right? So basically all you do is here's the Red Hat client, the, the command line tool. You sign up for an account, install the command line tools. I'm creating RHC app create. You can name this anything you want, but in my case, I named it Fluent Web App. You're saying I want Node.js 0.1, MongoDB 2.2. I want it to be scalable, and I want to use medium gears, which have a gig of RAM. Um, by default, if you don't specify that, it's going to use the small gears, which is a half a gig of RAM. Right? So you create that app. It spins it all up for you. It makes a Git repo and clones that Git repo down to your machine. So all that server software is now installed. You can SSH into that server, and you can type Mongo at the command line and start playing with Mongo. You can do anything you want on that machine as long as you don't think you're root, because you you're not root. You're a developer on the machine. And then to make the app run, you just, on your local machine, you CD into the Git repo that was cloned to your local machine. Add this GitHub repository, that's this line right here, the Fluent Web Map. You pull it down and overwrite everything in the local Git repo with what's in this repository, and then you just push it back up to the server. And it loads the data into the database, puts the code up there, puts the um, map page up there, and you're set to go. Right? So, if you see, OpenShift has these things called action hooks, which are part of the de deployment lifecycle. Right? And so I change the one that's called deploy. And so basically I do a little query. So when the app is getting ready to – every time you try to deploy the app, it runs this action hook, and it says, hey, what's the size of the database? And I say, if the size of the database is anything other than zero, don't do anything. There's already a data in the data store. If it is equal to zero, import the data, and make the 2D index. And that's it. Right? And so that loads up all the data so everything's ready to go. You can get clone that and push it on OpenShift and you'll have the app ready to go. And if, if you change the name of your data, all you have to do is when you clone it down, just change the name of your data here. Right? That's it. And if you make it into a different collection, but I'm putting into, it into part points. If you do a different collection, just change it there as well. Okay? That's all that's required. And go back. This is going to be recorded. I know I'm going through this relatively fast, but this is going to be recorded, and you can go back and watch it, and you can spin up this app. So I'm basically done. Let's go into the wrap-up. Uh, spatial is easy and fun with Mongo, Node, and Leaflet. 
I, I think, I hope, most of you come away from this workshop feeling, or this presentation actually, feeling like you could probably do this on your own at home. Um, if you watched the video a couple times and then just played with it a bit, it should be pretty easy for you to do. OpenShift makes life great for you, and by you I mean you the developer. Um, there was no need to learn how to install any of that software. There was no need to keep it up and running. There was no need to create web addresses or DNS entries or anything like that. You can basically spin it all up with one command. Right? And so it's great, even if you're not doing a production app, even if you just want to play around with some technology, you can spin this up tonight, not like it, destroy it all, and you'll have three more gears to do it with again. It's a great way to play around. But also, like what I was talking about before, with a, like if you work for a small town or you work for somewhere else or a, a newspaper and you need to have something up really quickly, this is an incredibly quick way to spin up an instance without having to talk to anybody. Right? You can just you enter your commands without having to talk to a systems administrator and you have everything going. Um, you can do this all for free in a matter of minutes, like I showed you. Once you do that git push, it takes about three minutes after the git push. So in total, it's 10 minutes to get that whole thing up and running especially if your data set's already set. And the price is zero, makes it so that you can do this for any project you want. Right? I mean, suppose your kids at your, uh, your school are doing a science project and they want to map something out in the yard. Well, okay, everybody, t or out in the school playground or out in a park near their place, you can take all of their, they can all take phones with them if they're teenagers. I don't think people under the age of 14 should have phones, personal caveat there. Um, unless they have some sort of activity where they need to be picked up at random hours. Um, and they can take their phones, take a picture, and then they can look at the GPS. You can even geotag them, upload them, and you can have this all up and running. Right? I give you in that code the example of how to do a post, so how to insert data into Mongo database. And it's so, I think it's so simple. So this is Gordon Half. He's one of our um, marketer analysts at Red Hat. And he saw this presentation. He's like, oh, I could do that. So on Twitter today he said, so simple, even a marketing person can do it. Right? And this is what he built using that same app. Right? So this is, he took the same app, and now he's doing USGS river gauges. He likes to canoe. And so what these now show, let's do one that's lower so it's not under the text, right? He, this is a USGS um, river gauge station, and it's showing you the, what the river's at. And then if you actually want to, he put in a link here because he knew the ID. This actually brings you to the link for that particular one, and you can pull in all the data. So if you're that type, you're all set. So surfers could do exactly something like this with all the stations out there, right? And you can zoom out. Oh, I think I broke it. No, nope, there we go. He's just got a lot more points than I do. There we go. So you, you can do any of this. You can see there's something wrong with that gauge there. But this is quick and easy. And then after I gave this talk at EuroPython, by the end of the second day, someone had built a database of all, they have a historical trees, really big old historical tree database. Somewhere, it was somewhere in Spain. I don't exactly remember where. But they had built a database like this for all their trees. Right? And you could click. They changed the color of the map. They changed the color of the pins. They used a, pin, a tree icon instead. But you could click, and you could look at where all the trees were located. So I, to me, this is, this is what I've always wanted web mapping to be like, like this easy to set up and this easy to get going. It's not a lot of high priest information you have to understand. So I'm done with the talk. Um, if you want to come hang out with the OpenShift people, uh, let's see, let's go back here. We are on IRC, on Freenode, in pound OpenShift, and it's also we're on this mailing list if you want to send questions when you use it. Let's go back to the questions. Great. What a great talk, Stephen. Thank you so very much. And we do have several questions that have come in. Folks, we are at the Q&A portion. If you have a question for Stephen and what he's been talking to you about and showing you, open that group chat widget, type it in, send it in, and we'll take as many as we have time for. And are you able to see those, Stephen? Yeah, I think so. the, the, the ones that are down here below. Yes. So I'll start, with right. no, I'll start with number one, and I'm going to leave the share on just for now, even though I know it might. Um, that's fine. That's uh, fine. Well, we'll just turn okay. the program back to you then. Thank you. Um, can I mention some Node.js use cases that, where Node.js doesn't fit? Um, I would say uh, I would want, it's someplace where you want high transactions, a lot of transactions. Right, and that kind of security and stability and a lot of, I mean, I think that the Java solutions are much more secure right now in terms of their clustering and all the different ways you can set it up. So with the failover, and it's just a much more mature technology. Um, I'm trying to think of some other ones. I'm sure there's plenty of other people out. If you look, <coughs> excuse me, if you look out there in the flame wars, I'm sure you can find a bunch of use cases where it doesn't actually fit. But the one that springs immediately to mind 
is where you want a lot of transactional support or a lot of clustering and failover. Okay. Um, the question was, does Node.js have transactional capabilities? Uh, I have not seen anything like that, but that's, you shouldn't take that as a definitive answer. Um, you might want to check um, more into the Node.js community. And by transactions, I I'm assuming you mean something like we're with an EJB and the good new EJBs, you can define a transaction around an event and roll it back in code rather than the database. Um, I, I don't know enough. I, don't, I haven't seen anything like that, but I don't know enough to say yes or no on that. Um, if you mean in Mongo, Mongo can do transactions, but then you lose most of the speed benefits. Um, Yasmin, am, am I, uh, or Yasmina, am I missing the number one? I can't see it down there, or did we already answer number one? Okay, if you see the button that turns red, the refresh button, can you click that? Yeah. It'll yep. give you a fresh load. And just you can start at the top and work your way down. I'm just adding more because several more are coming in. Okay. But there is no number one that I'm missing down below, right? No, no. Okay. So five is – I'm trying to go in the opposite order because I'm assuming these are the people that asked first. That is correct, yes. Okay. So um, the Tamir, you asked if I wanted to do a RESTful API node, should I use Express or is there something uh, else? I like Express. Um, I've been taught – on our team, Ryan Jarvanen is our node expert. He, I think it was called RESTlet. There's some other service that's specifically for REST in Node. Um, I didn't like it as much, but Ryan thinks it's the new thing. Um, it, although it, he said it was, he mentioned it was having some problems with static assets where Express doesn't. I think there, you can look for it. I think it's called RESTlet or something like that. I don't even remember the exact name, but it's specifically for building REST. But to me, the Express looks so simple that I didn't really need anything else. But I don't, I'm not building applic huge applications day in and day out. So, uh, Neil asks, the code written before when we were in the MongoDB section of the presentation, is that entered as a Mongo statement into a Mongo client? Um, if you're meaning DD like ensure index? If that's what you mean, you can do that as a Mongo client. But again, everything in Mongo can be executed in regular code. You could do that same statement in your JavaScript code. So for, again, back to Ryan. Ryan likes working in JavaScript for everything, so he wrote one of these quick starts like I just did in GitHub, but he does all the database loading and all the database um, indexing and everything using JavaScript calls to the database. So yeah, you can do it in the Mongo client, but you can also do it um, in your code if you want to. I prefer to do it, in the, like I'm old school that way. I prefer to do it like hands-on that way, uh, but it depends on how, what kind of app you're writing. Uh, let's see. Uh, what means S? Francis, Francis. I'm assuming Francis is talking about uh, – Francis, can you actually write back? And I think you're probably talking about Leaflet, but I can't exactly tell. Um, so can you write in another question and try to clarify that just a little bit? Thanks. Corey asks, um, the auto scaling is based on connections, but what determines how many nodes, how much your node server can handle at that time? Is it memory? No, actually, um, you can. So we use HA proxy as our load balancer, and you could write your own. You could have it based on memory. By default, we do it by a number of L incoming HTTP connections. And I forget exactly what the threshold is, but like once there's a certain number of connections coming in, we say, oh, okay, we're going to start waiting too long for things to respond, and so it's the wait number of waiting connections. And once the queue of waiting connections gets too big or is not closing out fast enough, we spin up another, another server. And then Corey also asks, is it different between WebSockets versus HTTP connections for auto-scaling? Yeah, and I'm not an expert on that. So we do support WebSockets, um, both uh, secure and, and normal WebSockets. And I don't know exactly how they affect scaling behavior. If you write a question, um, you can actually either put it on Twitter to ask OpenShift, you know, at OpenShift and just ask them, or you can send it to openshift at redhat.com, and that should get to us as well. I don't know. I, I just don't want to give you the wrong answer. So let me get rid of this one. Where's the other core one? This one. Can you do this all on Ubuntu 13.10? You can do everything except for OpenShift on Ubuntu 13.10. Um, if you do this on Ubuntu 13.10, you just have to install your own Node Mongo servers and get them running. My Git repository will probably not work because it's assuming that it's on OpenShift. I mean, the code is – you can take the 
node code and run that in your own node server, it'll work just fine. You'll have to take out the environment variables, right? Because mine looks when I go to connect to the database, I'm using environment variables rather than hard coding them in. Um, but there's, n there's nothing about the code that we write is particular to OpenShift. It's just straight node code. It's straight Mongo calls. You don't have to do anything funky. So the code can move over, but the app, you can't probably take the Git repo directly and deploy it on, I know you can't because it's got environment variables in it, and deploy it on your Ubuntu machine. But the code should all work once you make it a little bit less OpenShift specific with the environment variables. Um, what maps can you use besides OpenStreetMap? Well, so what I will do here now, I knew I was going to get that question, but I'm going to go back here to Leaflet and look at the plugins page. And let's see, I think it was right, where did it go? You can add Raphael as a layer to, on top, but that's not what you're asking. You're asking service providers. So here, um, a set of plugins for GPX, KML layers, Bing tile layer, Google and Yen, Yandex layers implemented with their APIs. So that's what that one has. Um, here's Ricardo DB, uh, leaflet vector layers. So you can add a vector layer on top of one of the other layers from one of these other servers. Um, OpenStreetMap, here's another one. Convi client contains configurations for file tile providers like OSIM, OpenCycleMap, MapQuest, Stamen, Esri, etc. So there's a bunch out there, and I'm pretty sure most of these are probably open source, so if you wanted to adapt it to one of your own, you could probably do that as well. Uh, let's go back to the questions, which means I have to go to here. And, okay. Uh, the Python server example. So uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. Let's go here. I think I'm going to show you the magical um, Google search phrase to get that. If you do OpenShift Python um, Flask, uh, no, 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 no. Here, this one. No, oh, well, there's this should be there. Do the, the quick start that's up on OpenShift. So it's on OpenShift dash quick start. And this is the example here. Um, this one does not have the bounding box query implemented, uh, I don't think. Let's see, I think I do parks, park, near, near a name. No. So this one doesn't have the bounding box, but you can use the JavaScript example to show you how you would write the within query, right? And then that's it. You, ba it, you just need to implement the within on this, and the code would look very similar. So again, that was OpenShift Quick Start is the, the owner, and then the OpenShift Mongo Flask example. Okay? Okay, how do you add authentication to this to protect sensitive data? Um, there's nothing specific, Chris, to this. Uh, Chris Marotti? I think it's Marotti. Marotti. Um, there's nothing specific to it. You would do it any way you wanted to authenticate any web app, right? So you could throw some sort of single CERN provider in front of it. You could do a simple, we support, you know, a .ht access file if you want to put a .ht access file, although Node wouldn't know how to do the .ht access file. You'd have to look at how people secure Node apps, right, if you want to use the Node example. If you use the Python or the Java example or the Ruby example, then you can use all sorts of other ways. It, there's nothing particular to this that uh, prevents that. Uh, the next question is uh, OpenShift versus Heroku. Well, I would say OpenShift, of course. Um, but in honesty, I think some of the benefits that we have over Heroku is that uh, Mongo will be local on your machine. Um, the Open sh the Node.js is supported. Uh, we give you permanent disk, disk space if you need it. So like if you need to upload pictures, you don't have to store them off in S3 or something. You can actually store them on your application, and it will survive application stops and restarts. Um, we give you more resources for free, and when you move into the paid tier, we give you it's cheaper. Uh, it's open source, so you can actually look at the source code. You can actually take it. Suppose for some reason you don't like our online service, which I would find very hard to believe. That's a joke. But um, if you didn't, you could actually take the you could take OpenShift Origin, or you could buy OpenShift Enterprise and stand it up on your own hardware, or put it up in Rackspace, or put it up in Amazon's cloud yourself, and run it any way you wanted to do it, and the code would still work between all of them. You could just move your code around, right? 
So there's no lock-in on that either. So if you need a hybrid solution or you want a private solution, OpenShift is going to provide that for you as well. Um, that, that's basically my OpenShift versus Heroku thing. And then does Leaflet have a get directions feature? So um, a lot of people would love to have directions. It's actually not that easy to do on OpenStreetMap. Um, OpenStreetMap is not the best routing database in the world, but if we go back to the plugins, let's see if there's something on directions. So they have an address lookup, right, which you can do to find the addresses, but I do not know if they have one that does get directions. I think you probably have to write that yourself. Um, I do have a, if you did this all with, um, if you do this all with PostGIS, I have written a blog post up on OpenShift about using PG routing with OpenShift data. So you could actually have a button that calls back into the database, asks PG routing for the data, and sends that back. Um, I talk about that some. Uh, the problem, just the caveats I have with OpenStreetMap data around routing is except for like Germany and a couple other countries, there are not enough turn restrictions and one-way street information in the database to make it safe and then there's no speeds in there either to make it really good for car routing. Um, it's great for pedestrian and bike routing, but it's not so good for car routing. So uh, and unless, of course, you just can assume that all roads are two ways and there's no turn restrictions and you don't care about speed, but you just want the most direct, you can do that with PG routing. PG routing also does some other fun stuff, like um, it can do traveling salesman's problems, it can do multiple routes or multiple stops along a route. It can use different search algorithms for the best path. It's pretty fun. So if you search on PG routing, open shifts, and uh, T-O-U-S-T-Y, my last name, I'm sure that article will come up and you can learn all about it. And then look at for Ryan to turn how to turn my map into talking to PostGIS. Okay. Uh, let's see what else we got. Uh, what do I need to learn if I want to write a simple interface to crowdsource the input data? Um, so crowdsourcing the data, it's a, first off, uh, the only thing you need to learn to write is, um, from a technical perspective, is if you go back to that Node.js code I showed you, let's see if we can go back to the GitHub repo. Yeah, let's go back here. Um, you would have to write something on the client side that would push, do a put into, Notice that I did, when I did these, the routes, I did self.app.post. So if there's a post to WS Parks Park, that actually accepts a post of information to put it into the park. So let's see if we can find that one. So post to park. Where is post to park? Probably should be at the end. Yeah. So basically what it does is it's assuming they're bot, like there's an, a JSON body, and it's pulling out the name, the lat, and the long, right? And then it's, this is the Mongo call, self, DD, collection, park points. So on the park points collection, Insert, name is name, pause is that, and that's it. Right? That's, how you ins that's all it would take to insert a new one. So you'd have to write something on the client side to actually insert the data. But in reality, if you were making a real crowdsourced application, you would also probably want to have some sort of way for it to be in a just entered state, not a verified state, and then have people verify it or do something. Like you probably want to build a little bit more architecture around making thing, things which are just inputted and things which are inputted and verified. But, I mean, you have all the, that's just the same to do here, right? I mean, this is pretty easy to write all the pieces. You just write another function. You, write, you could write another web page that shows all the unverified points on a map, and then you could have something where somebody clicks on an unverified point and then can either move it using Leaflet and submit the new coordinates and make it verified, or they, don't, they like it where it is and they can just click a button that says verified, and you update the value to be verified. Right, so I would change the schema for all the points to have a, a verified value, which is maybe either true or false, or yes or no, or whatever you want to do. But the, you basically need a post is all you need, because right, you really want to put data in. And Leaflet should be able to help you with that as well. Does Mongo auto scale as well with OpenShift sharding, since it's local? Um, this is from Corey. Uh, Corey, no, it does not just yet. Um, we're working with Tengen, or I'm sorry, mongodb.com, on that right now. Um, that will be one of the first ones we support on uh, auto-scaling. Auto-scaling for relational databases is a little bit more of a tricky problem, and we're still working on that as well. What we do find in most cases, though, is that people hit um, app server issues, although that may not happen with Node as much, 
But people usually hit app server issues before they hit database scaling issues, um, especially when it's a read-heavy application. But yeah, the answer I gave you the answer, and then I gave you the kind of a caveat. All right. Uh, got this when I tried to configure creating application for and that this year size medium is not valid for this domain. Allowed size small. So Jim Scott says he can't get that size. Jim, you can only get access to the medium um, gears when you're in a pay, in the paid tier. So you'd have to enter the paid tier. It costs a little bit more to run one. So if you're just in the um, the free tier, you'll have to run it in the small. That's all. But since I have since I work there and I guess you did, I built it in the medium tier. Link for liquid, please. I'm not sure what liquid is. Does anybody else remember what liquid was? No, oh, it looks like it, except for the liquid one. You have another any other un un put in questions? I'm not seeing any additional questions, folks. If you do have one last question, please send it in now while Stephen is still with us. Oh, and Tully says sorry, invalid question on the liquid. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, because I was going to say I have a cup of tea right next to me. I don't know how I'd get it to you, Tali, but um, I don't think a link would get it there. <laughs> All right, folks. So with that, we're going to say a very big thank you to you, Stephen, for spending your time with us today and presenting a really fabulous talk. And all your live examples were just great. Thank you so much for that. Thanks, everybody.